so we will get cracking. So welcome everyone. Um, thank you so much for joining us, especially if you've been running a school today. I'm sure four o'clock is not the ideal time to uh, sit down and start thinking again. So thank you very much. We really appreciate you joining us. Um, I'm just going to share my screen and then we will talk a few housekeeping things and we'll just go through the agenda and go from there. So I'm hoping one of my colleagues will just give me a little thumbs up to show me that's great. Good. So um, just first thing I just wanted to highlight everyone is that we are recording the session today. And that is so that anybody that can't make it today can catch up on the webinar. So obviously you are all muted and don't have your video showing anyway, but there will be a Q&A section. So it's just worth bearing in mind that if you submit any questions, you might just want to think about confidentiality, maybe best to avoid any school names or specific examples. In terms of questions, if you have questions as we go through the webinar, we're going to do all the questions at the end because a lot of the um, different speakers will have things that overlap. So it might be easier. It might be that multiple speakers want to come in on a question. But please do feel free to use the Q&A box as you go. My colleague Binda is going to be monitoring the questions and then she will sort of direct questions at the end. In terms of our agenda today, uh, just a little bit of uh, introduction to the session from myself. Then I'm going to hand over to my colleague, Dr. Rebecca Montague, who is Head of Research and Policy here at the Sutton Trust. She's going to talk to you about uh, some of our research that we've done into this area, especially our recent report that you might have seen, Selective Comprehensive 24. Then I'm going to hand you over to Dr. Ellen Greaves, who's been working closely with us and has done a wealth of research in her own right into this area as well. So she's going to be talking a little bit about oversubscription criteria and kind of the kind of rules that we use in this country to select children. And then we're going to hand over to Curtis and Carly from Class Divide. And you may well have seen the uh, sort of journey that Brighton and Hove have been on recently. Um, Brighton and Hove have just chosen to introduce a pupil premium priority criteria in their oversubscription criteria. And Carly and Curtis were key players in the kind of campaign around that. So they're going to talk a little bit about their journey. And then to wrap all of that up, we're going to come back to me. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about uh, the opportunities that we have here for schools to get involved, and then we'll end on questions. So before, um, before any of us talk any more, as I say, I'm sure lots of you have had very busy days. So I thought it might be helpful to start with a couple of questions just to get our minds in the right place, to sort of gather our thoughts about admissions before we launch into it. So my colleague Sophie is going to um, do this as a poll, I'm hoping. Uh, but there's a couple of questions that we'd like to hear some responses for. So first of all, what's motiv motivated you to join us today? So particularly thinking about your settings, why is school admission something that's important to you? What, what made you want to be here today? And then finally, what are the biggest barriers that you think you might be facing in addressing school admissions in your setting? So I'm just going to give everyone a couple of minutes to pop any answers in they've got to that. We can then have a look through them during the webinar and sort of get a sense of why people are here and we can sort of tailor some of our content to that. So just a couple of minutes, everyone, to pop your answers into that. I'll give everyone another minute or so. Okay, guys, thank you very much for that. My colleague and I will have a look through those during the session today and we'll move on. So. Sophie, if we're okay to have the poll come down. Brilliant. So thinking about school admissions, I think a really helpful starting point um, looking at school admissions is kind of a headline that we've been using in quite a lot of our media around this recently, which is that if you are eligible for free school meals, you're less likely to attend a top school, even if there is one in your catchment area. And this is something that we've consistently found over the years in our research that my colleague Rebecca's going to talk to you a little bit more about. But really what that means is that 
if you are poor, you are less likely to go to a good school. And I think everybody that's taken the time to join this session today can agree that that is really something that we need to address. And actually, there's a lot of reasons why looking at admissions could have a really massive impact. We all know that the attainment gap is at an 11 year high at the minute. So we do need to start thinking creatively and maybe outside of the box about how we're going to address that. And school admissions may not strike you as an immediate solution to that problem, but actually we think it could have some really big impacts. So in terms of admissions and why they're important, first of all, we know that, you know, there is a fundamental kind of moral and ethical thing here that all children deserve to go to a good school. That's kind of first and foremost in our minds. And we also know that a really good education is the best thing we can give children on their journey to social mobility and to sort of future success and having a solid career and all those things that we know are important. But actually there are wider effects as well. So uh, research that we did at the Sutton Trust showed that the schools that have the greatest proportion of children that are disadvantaged also have the most trouble recruiting and retaining their teachers. And that's particularly prominent in your shortage subjects like science, maths and French and modern foreign languages. So actually, we'll have all heard about the recruitment and retention problem in teaching. One of the things that we might be able to do to kind of ease that issue is if all schools took a fairer share of disadvantaged children, that means that it might be a little bit fairer for all schools, but it's on a level playing field. It's a really cost effective solution as well. So it doesn't cost the school anything to make the changes that we're suggesting today. Um, even if you wanted to do, you know, one of our boldest suggestions, which is to change your admissions policy, that doesn't fundamentally cost anything. And actually, if you are a school that then increases their intake of free school meal children as a result of this work, you would actually access more funding as a result of that. So actually, it's, you know, we've all seen the government pour millions of pounds into different things that we might be able to do, but this really won't be one of those things. It's very, very cost effective. We think it would create more socially inclusive and diverse schools which can only be a good thing <laughs> will better prepare children for the world that they are going to go and enter and there's also research that shows that parents that are happy with their school choice are subsequently more engaged in that school now I have worked at a school with that was undersubscribed where we used to get local authority allocated families so I know from experience that you are on the back foot immediately with those families so if we can help more families get the choice that they really want we might have a better starting point to work with some of those more hard to reach families as well. We know that the situation isn't getting better. So we've done research into this across several periods of time. And actually our most recent report shows that the situation with school admissions might be getting worse, but it's definitely not getting any better. So it's not one of those things that we can just sort of think, oh, it will probably be all right. We don't need to do anything about it. it this does require proactive and deliberate action. And finally, this is a long term system change. This is something that we could put in place that we invest a bit of time and work into now that could have re consequences for thousands of children for years and years to come. So this is a system change that really could benefit so many children. So I'm going to hand you over to Dr. Rebecca Montague. I'll come off the screen for you. And she's going to talk to you in a little bit more detail about our research into this area. Thanks very much. I'm just going to share my screen. And a huge thank you for me as well for everyone who has given up their time to come along and watch this today as well. We very much appreciate it. Apologies, I've just lost where my screen actually is. Ah, there we go. Sorry about that. Right, thank you so much, everyone. So I'm going to chat you through some of the research that the Sutton Trust has done on this topic previously, just to kind of set the scene a little bit, give you an idea of the scale of the issue and where it's having the worst kind of impacts. So to say that most of what I'll be talking about today is based on these two Sutton Trust reports. So one of them has been mentioned already, that's Selective Comprehensives 2024. This was a report where we did an update looking at a really similar report that we done back in 2017. But this is research that we've been looking at for really quite a long time now. I think one of the first ones was back in kind of the early 2000s. 
So we've been looking at this issue for a while and kind of building up the evidence base. And now we really want to try to get actual movement on it. And that's why we're doing a lot of this kind of wider work at the moment. The second piece that I'll also talk a little bit about is a piece we did back in 2020, where we looked at the views of teachers, schools, parents on changes to the system. And that's quite useful as just kind of how people are feeling about potential changes. So first off, why are we talking about comprehensive schools? What is the purpose of this? And one of the reasons why we focused on comprehensive schools in this work, and I will talk a tiny bit about grammars later on, is because they are the majority of schools and are where the vast majority of students actually go to. So what the admissions policies of those schools are, are really, really important in terms of what happens to the vast majority of children. And as has been talked about, and in some ways this will be from an absolute accident of policy, and in some ways there will be policies that people are maybe slightly more aware of that can sometimes have these barriers, but whether purposeful or not, these schools, and especially the highest performing of these schools, are currently selecting pupils on the basis of their social economic background. And we'll chat through some of the evidence on that here. So a lot of this research will look at something called the FSM gap. And this is just an example to explain how that gap is calculated. So it looks at the FSM rate in the, of pupils in a school's intake, and then the FSM rate of pupils in the catchment area. So you can see an example here where there are more students eligible for free school meals in the catchment area than there are in the school. And that's what gives us a negative gap in terms of the FSM rate, the FSM gap. So we'll be talking about that as we go, go kind of through this presentation. And I'll be saying different figures, which sometimes are based on progress eight and sometimes are based on attainment eight. Now, the reason for this is, as any of you working in schools will be well aware, they tell you different things and they have different kind of positives and negatives about them. So progress eight being telling us about the progress that someone has made over time and attainment eight just being the kind of flat overall attainment. So we will look at both of those figures here and it's important to think about them in that context. So you'll have seen that we've talked about the proportion of students eligible for free school meals in a school's catchment area. Now, there's been a, a certain way of calculating this in this report because of the fact that not all schools, and I'm sure Ellen will talk about this more in her presentation, use a catchment area as such. So some schools will have a catchment area very explicitly. Others will have what becomes a de facto catchment area in terms of who actually ends up getting admitted to the school. So perhaps there's no actual boundaries and barriers on the edge, but because they use distance as a criteria, it ends up being that pupils are only admitted or tend to be admitted within a certain area. So here we've looked at splitting all the households up into areas made up of between 400 and 1,200 households. And each of those little areas got included for us in a school's catchment area if at least five pupils from that area over the last three intakes the school had went on to go to that school. So this is a way of getting around the fact that not everyone has a catchment area explicitly and lets us look at who actually went to those schools and areas that were like able to have people go to them from. So, for instance, it gets around some of the issues around, say, transport options although obviously some families might be able to go there even if they're further away and others wouldn't be able to. So important to keep that in mind as well. But this did cover the vast majority of pupils going to any of these schools. So when we talk about the catchment area, this is what we're talking about. So to have a look at first, what is actually the issue in terms of the overall gap? So Overall, in the average comprehensive school, 22% of pupils are eligible for free school meals. But the data here also then looks at these kind of top 500 schools, which we mentioned before. And we've separated those as measured by progress A and by attainment A. So as talked about those two different ways of looking at kind of how pupils are doing. Now, in the top 500 schools for progress A, only 17.1% of those students are eligible for free school meals. So there's, and if we compare those schools to those catchment areas I talked about, 
the amount of free school meal students they have is 4.3 percentage points lower than their catchment areas. So some of these differences will be because those schools just aren't near those pupils. But by looking at that catchment area, we can say that it is also schools that could have been accessible to them. And also looking at attainment eight, then the gap is even larger, as you'd probably expect on that measure, which is only 13.3 percent of students eligible for free school meal are eligible for free school meals at those schools. And that is 5.8 percentage points lower than their catchment areas. So to give you an idea of the kind of challenge that we're talking about and the size of gaps that we're talking about in terms of access. And then if we split all schools up between those, oops, sorry, between those that are kind of the lowest attaining schools and the highest attaining schools, so splitting them all up into groups, and here you can see the percentage of all schools that fell into those groups when we did this. Looking at the free school meal rate, you can see the lowest attaining schools have the highest proportion and the highest attaining schools have the lowest proportion of free school meal students. And the FSM gap ends up being the biggest gap, so the largest negative in those highest attaining schools. So their actually admitted pupils look the most different from their catchment areas. So this really goes all the way across. It's not just about those top kind of 500. Then we also looked at different types of school and what the gaps were like in different types of school. And as you can see here, the largest gaps, so again, the biggest, most negative gaps were in voluntary aided and foundation schools, then followed by academy converters, free schools, community schools and voluntary controlled schools and academy sponsored led and city technology colleges actually had slightly more free school bill pupils than you would expect from their catchment areas. So there are differences between different school types within this top 500 schools. And there's a particular issue when we look at faith schools, and those tend to be more socially selective overall than non-religious schools. And those schools are actually overrepresented in the top 500 schools. And that's under both Attainment A and Progress A. So faith schools make up 19% of all comprehensive schools, but on Progress 8, they make up 29% of the top 500 schools, and on Attainment 8, they make up 34% of them. So they are being overrepresented in those top schools. And then if we just look at the FSM rates, so in all comprehensive and non-religious schools, the average FSM rate is 22.4%. Now, in religious schools in general, that goes down to 20.6%, but it is particularly acute in those top performing schools. So here you can see it goes down further to just 14.7% in top 500 schools that are religious. And there is still, it goes down more for non-religious schools in the top 500 as well, but that gap is bigger. And also in top 500 schools by attainment eight, and it's as low as 12.5% in the religious schools of that type. So there is a particular problem when we look at religious schools as well. And then if we look at different parts of the country, there are also challenges there. So we looked over time at how this has changed. And since 2016, London actually has become less socially selective, although it now has more of the top 500 schools than it did previously. The North East, North West and West Midlands have all actually overtaken London as the regions with the highest percentage, first off, of pupils in their FSM pupils in their school intakes. But then if we look at the Northeast, it actually has both among the fewest top 500 schools, but those that there are are among the most socially selective, presumably potentially in part because there is higher competition to be able to get into those schools because there are fewer of them around in that area. And a similar story, fewer top schools and greater social selectivity also applies in some more overall disadvantaged areas of the country. So there are also regional differences in terms of how we're seeing the impacts of this. And I said I would say a little bit about, about grammar schools. So you might be sat here thinking, well, aren't grammar schools worse? And why are we so focused on the comprehensive schools? I mean, Part of the reason we're so focused on the comprehensive schools is because they make up so many of the schools. 
And by fixing issues around access there, we've got the potential of reaching the most students and giving the, the kind of best overall access. But I did think I would just show quickly some of the data for grammar schools. And yes, they are even more socially selective than the top comprehensives. So just 5.7% of those pupils are eligible for free school meals. So that is worse than the top 500 by either PA or AA. Uh, and also one important thing, but one important thing to point out about this is that that 500 is obviously a big group. And actually some of those individual schools, 155 of them, actually have a more negative free school meal gap in terms of the difference between catchment and intake than you see on average in grammar schools. So there are particular problems, especially in some of these very most socially selective of these schools. So fair to say overall that grammars are more socially selective, but you do see real high levels of social selectivity in some of these top schools as well. So I think Ellen might talk a bit more about this when she talks about kind of the current admissions policies of schools and what we see there. But I just wanted to talk a little bit about what some of the reasons behind these differences might be. And I think one of the major things is that use of distance criteria in school admissions, which creates essentially a house price premium near top schools. So better off families can increase their odds of getting a spot to a top school by buying a house nearby to it. And I literally just did a little bit of a search in news of house prices, top schools. And you can see the kind of stories that you'll be used to seeing all the time. Things like homes for sale near London's best state schools for less than the absolute bargain of £650,000. Or where are the areas that house prices are going up because of the fact it's helping you to get access to one of these schools? And I even found a, a local story in Tunbridge Wells where homes are going for over £1 million because of the demand for good schools. So this is having a, a really, you know, quite considerable impact and is impacting housing affordability, but also where those students are able to go to those schools. Now, parental choice does play a role in, in all of this around school admissions, but what's really important to keep in mind is that not all parents have the same kind of choices available to them. So free school meal households on average choose schools with lower academic attainment. And it might be that in some of those cases that the families are thinking about things other than overall school quality and what they're choosing. But it also absolutely reflects the fact that poorer students live nearer to those schools. So, you know, we can talk about parental choice in this, but it's important to keep in mind that for many parents, those choices are quite constrained. And other factors can also influence that choice, including transport availability, other associated costs of attendance, so things like school uniforms and access, and also the access to information that parents have as well, and making sure that that's really clear to parents, especially around things like additional financial support. So I said I would mention some of the views of teachers and of parents, and this is from that other report that we did a few years ago, looking at views. And we did find that 50% of school leaders think that social segregation is a problem in state schools. So we know this is something that you as school leaders do recognise as an issue in the system. And it's also something that parents care about as well. So 78% of parents believe schools should have a fairer mix of pupils from different backgrounds. And 38% of senior leaders say they take the social economic makeup of their local community into account when they're setting admissions policies. So this is something people are thinking about. And we're so happy you guys are here today because that's part of that wider conversation of thinking about potential solutions to this. And also brilliantly, 62% of senior leaders said that they were open to conducting a fair admissions review of their policies to look at what they could do. And Charlie will talk a bit more about that as an option later on. So in terms of options to actually change those policies and what can be done, first off, there's the general issue around actually changing the, the actual policies around school admissions. So one of them, and we suggest a kind of variety of different options and schools can choose to take one or a couple of these and implement it as works best in their setting. But one of the most simple things that schools can do if they do have this as an issue is to actually include pupil premium students in that oversubscription priority criteria. 
So have it as part of those priority criteria that will perhaps come before something like distance from school to make sure those people, premium students, get a chance to be able to get a place and not being excluded because of the distance that they live away from the school. We also suggest you could either use a ballot or a banding system, but as with any change, and I'm sure school leaders are so aware of this in their own settings, it's all in the implementation. So a ballot is about having a kind of area that within you could have a lottery for the places and randomise who actually gets access to them rather than doing it on distance. Now, you could do this as an outright one for all places or just a subset. And there's lots of different ways of doing it, but that can also remove the role of closeness to school in how in kind of access to those schools goes. And a banding system is one where you do tests of the pupils for ability, say, and then you actually admit them in bands by attainment. And that can also really help with getting a good social economic mix throughout the school as well. But some schools have done that and ended up actually with less good um, kind of social economic mix in their admissions because they only did the bans based on who did the test and only better off pupils from better off families did the test. So it's really important to make sure those tests are widely done and that you're looking at the overall spectrum of attainment and not just who's taking the test. So the implementation there is key. And as I mentioned, there are schools like faith schools that have particular issues with this, and they really need to think quite carefully about their policies and how those interact with social economic access. Now, I've run out of time, so I won't go on any longer. I will just say extremely briefly that there's also really important things schools can do. And I think uh, Charlotte will talk about a bit more around removing financial barriers and looking at that information that is available to parents as well. Thank you impeccable timekeeping Becky thank you uh so thank you very much if you've got I can see some of the questions have already started to come in but if any of that has kind of piqued your interest and you've got any questions pop them in the Q&A box um or you might see a question in there that someone else has already asked that you can upvote and we will answer those at the end of the session so I'm going to hand over to Dr Ellen Greaves now who's going to talk to you a little bit about the different criteria that schools are using already to make these school choices Wonderful, thank you very much. Uh, so I'll just do the share in my screen bit before I get started. Okay, so I'm mainly going to talk today about an ongoing project um, that I'm working on with my colleague Simon Burgess at the University of Bristol and, and a few other colleagues as well. Um, and the ongoing project is funded by the Nuffield Foundation. And our aim is to, first of all, find out what schools are currently doing when they set their school admissions criteria. And second of all, what the, effect of, what the effect of their choices might be. So how would choosing an admissions criteria, which moves away from geography, moves away from catchment areas, what effects might that have on eventual attainment, eventual pupil outcomes, um, cohesion, that kind of thing. Now, this project is ongoing. So unfortunately, I can't share the second stage of the project. What I'll talk about today is um, the first stage, which was gathering data for every single secondary school in the country and seeing what they currently do, what criteria they currently use um, when they set their school admissions. Um, so on we go. Oh. So today I'll just give um, a brief context for the study and then talk through the main points, um, the main findings that we had. Um, in terms of geography, um, selection, so not only grammar schools, but thinking about aptitude um, and ability tests, um, use of the pupil premium, use of banding and lottery, as Rebecca was uh, mentioning, and the policy implications from our, some of our study. And if I have time, I'll go on to talk about the next steps as well. So first of all, the context. I framed the discussion as the, the rules schools choose. How do schools choose to set their admissions criteria? Now, it's not the case that every single secondary school in England will have their choice, but now with the rise of academy schools and free schools, 90% of schools do. So um, it's the community schools and the um, uh, voluntary controlled schools, which still would go with their local authority policy, but now the majority of schools in England have the freedom to choose their school admissions criteria within the school admissions code. So you can see here that the, the graph stops in 2019, 
this is because our data collection was for the 20, um, 2020 21 academic year. So the results that I'll show here are a few years out of date, um, but we think we're going to capture the main trends um, in, in what schools are doing. So one of the main um, points that we, we found in our report was that geography is one of the main ways in which schools choose, if they're oversubscribed, who to, um, which pupils to admit. So overall, it's just under 90% of schools have some form of geography in their admissions criteria. Over half of schools will have a catchment area in any position. So this would be a predefined area where if a pupil lives within, they would have priority and access to the school. There is some variation in this across school types. So free schools, these new schools are less likely to have predefined catchment areas. And it's very uncommon in London. London is much more likely to use straight line distance rather than a predefined catchment area. Where a catchment area does feature in the admissions criteria for a school, it's very likely to be in the top three um, uh, criteria. So it's very likely to be a deciding factor in which pupils um, get into the school. In contrast, the distance criterion is mainly used as a tiebreaker. So it might be that um, uh, a school has a policy where siblings have priority and then it's the catchment area. And this distance criterion might be used to break ties between siblings that live in the catchment area, for example. So, so it's the same point, the, the distance criterion is a, is a common tie-breaking rule where pupils are otherwise have similar um, priority at the school. So just to say that the school admissions code does allow for other uses. Um, for, um, for example, a school could choose to have a lottery tiebreaker rather than a distance tiebreaker. What we found through um, this, this huge data collection for every single secondary school in the country was that only a minority of schools used a lottery tiebreaker without considering distance um, under 4%. Although that is used more by free schools, around 10% of free schools have a lottery tiebreaker without a distance tiebreaker. Another way to, to kind of break the link between where a child lives and, and school access is to reserve some of your school places for those that live outside of the catchment. So it might be that 80% of your school places are for those, you know, you give priority to those um, from the catchment, but 20% you reserve for those that live outside. Now, again, this is feasible for schools to do and would help um, increase diversity in, in school places, but we see currently, or at least for the 2020 school year, that very few schools were making use of this. Again, it was slightly more common in free schools, around 7% of free schools made use of that um, option. So on to selection. Um, and a really interesting point um, by Rebecca in, in her presentation about the role of uh, selective schools and the overall um, um, uh, thinking about how accessible certain schools are. I think selective, role, selective schools do play a role. But something that we found in our report is that there are even more schools which have some form of partial selection. So there are, in addition to the 163 fully selective grammar schools, there are 41 schools which are allowed to be partially selective um, um, due to their arrangements in the 1997-8 school year. There are also 162 schools, possibly now more, with um, allowed to select 10% of their intake according to an aptitude or an ability quota. So, for example, where a school has a music specialism, they may take 10% of their pupils according to um, this aptitude. So this sound, this may sound very sensible, and, and I'm sure it does have benefits that a school with a specialism can, can select a, a proportion of their pupils according to that specialism. But we should bear in mind that it may have a socially selective dimension. Um, even if we think about sport, the pupils, the, the parents with the most um, resources might be able to best improve their child's chances of getting those um, aptitude places. And that's even more um, obvious when we think about languages or music which types of parents can invest in their kids developing these skills. So we found in our report that higher performing schools are more likely to use some form of test priority. Um, and this raises an interesting question about the direction of causality. Is it the case that these higher performing schools are better able um, to select these pupils or is the selection of the pupils 
leading to these schools being more um, highly performing. So I think the role of selection is much broader than just thinking about grammar schools in England. We have to also consider these, these other types of partially selective schools as well. Okay, so the next um, thing we found was that very, school, very few schools are using the pupil premium um, as, a, as an additional criteria. So some background. Um, the pupil premium was introduced, I probably don't need to give the background to this audience, but it's been around since 2011. It gives additional funding for each, each pupil which is eligible for the pupil premium. Um, and from 2014, the School Admissions Code has um, allowed schools to give pupils priority if they're eligible for the pupil premium. And one of the motivations for this was to try and incentivize schools to try and attract um, these pupils and maybe to try and diversify school intakes. What we saw for the 2020 school year is that uh, around one and a half percent of non-selective schools had actually taken up the opportunity to give um, pupils eligible for the pupil premium um, priority at their school. Sorry, that's a bit of a mouthful. Um, so hardly any comprehensive schools in England have chosen to give these pupils priority currently. So with the reform in Brighton and Hove, that will probably double overnight. Um, so, so certainly room for growth in the number of schools which are, which are trying to implement that policy. You can see in, in my uh, final bullet point that almost 80% of selective schools have chosen to give the pupil premium priority, which sounds great. These schools, it seems from the surface, are being more proactive, trying to improve the diversity of their intakes. One important caveat is that for the majority of selective schools, this is only conditional on the pupil passing the test in the first place. So conditional on passing the test, the pupil eligible for the pupil premium would have priority, but they have to get to that test score first of all. So how does this affect um, pupil composition in practice? This is the overall distribution of the proportion of pupils eligible for free school meals in selective schools in blue and non-selective schools in the transparent bars. So the first takeaway message is that selective schools are clustered right at the lower end. Most um, selective schools have uh, fewer than 10% of pupils eligible for free school meals. So this is the first indication that although they're prioritizing in practice um, pupils eligible for free school meals, this isn't necessarily translating into changes in their pupil intake. So also to, to back that up, here we have the distribution just for schools that are um, selective. And in the blue this time, uh, the selective schools that have chosen to implement the pupil premium um, priority, and in the transparent bars are the schools which have chosen not to. And you can see here that the distribution overlaps. It's not the case that it doesn't seem obvious that the, the schools that have had the pupil premium priority have in, dramatically increased um, the share of pupils eligible for free school meals. And in fact, the average is slightly lower um, than those that haven't chosen to reform their admissions criteria. So I think the overall point of this, um, um, this example, we, yes, we can think about selective schools, but I think a more fundamental point is that the, the design of your criteria has to be really carefully thought through. It really matters about the ordering of the admissions criteria, not only whether you have a specific criteria in your policy. Okay, so I have a few minutes left. I'll, I'll say a few words on banding and, and lottery. Um, so there's a quote at the top of the slide, which highlights that these are two potential tools which could be used to um, dramatically uh, change school composition um, beneficially. So currently, as, as has been the theme, these more um, non-geographic, more innovative admissions criteria are currently only used by a, by a handful of schools effectively. Um, so banding, Rebecca has already explained, um, it's more strongly concentrated in, in London for historical reasons. It used to be that London had a banding policy um, across the whole place when it was the Inner London, Inner London Education Authority. This has been retained or um, exist today. In some cases, it, it's um, been removed and then reinstated. Um, but four local authorities now have local authority-wide banding. 
And this gets around the problem that Rebecca was mentioning that a particular school might implement banding, but end up with a less diverse intake. If this is done at the local authority level, each school is allocated a more representative set of pupils. Um, so, so as I went, four, four local authorities have this local authority wide banding and around 70 more have it banding at the school level. On to lottery. So as um, Pastor Vide will talk about shortly, there's a local authority wide policy in Brighton and Hove. It's less common elsewhere, although it is more common in free schools. And something that we, um, that was a common theme in our analysis was that free schools seem to be doing things more differently. Um, and an interesting question is why? Are there perhaps barriers to um, existing schools changing their admissions criteria, whereas free schools can start with a blank slate? Um, so just, just two minutes left. Um, uh, to make the point quickly, although it's maybe not so relevant for the, for the school audience, this is more for local authorities. In many local authorities, the information provision um, was not adequate. Parents didn't have enough information to make their school choices clearly. On to a more fundamental point. The school admissions code says that admission authorities and an academy school would be the admission authority must ensure that their arrangements will not dis disadvantage unfairly, either directly or indirectly, a child from a particular social or racial group. So this element of the school admissions code has very clearly outlawed um, parent interviews, um, um, things that overtly will select pupils. What I think there could be more dialogue and discussion about is whether things like catchment areas, things like geographic admissions criteria more generally, do present an unfair disadvantage, which will indirectly um, disadvantage pupils from particular neighborhoods or a particular social or racial group. Um, so as I said, this is, the, this is midway through the project. So then our next steps are to evaluate the effects of the schools that have chosen these more innovative admissions criteria. How does that affect who chooses their school, who gets in, pupil composition, and so on? And the final ambitious step of the project is to estimate or simulate what would happen to school and neighborhood composition if more schools were to adopt such criteria. Okay, thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Ellen. And I think it's it's such an impressive data set and it's been really helpful because it's allowed us to identify case study schools. And we're really excited to share some of those case studies with schools that are interested lo later down the line. So it's a really exciting piece of research to keep your eye on. So I'm going to pass over to Carly and Curtis now. And um, I was at the meeting that they're going to show you a clip of and I've been really involved in school admissions for about six months and I found it really emotional so I can only imagine how emotional Carly and Curtis found their successes in Brighton and Hove so I'll hand it over to them. The committee agreed to change Sorry, that clip came in a little bit too early there. Um, I had something to say first. Um, so, yeah, just uh, I'm Curtis um, and I'm with Carly Goldsmith. We're from an organisation called Class Divide based in Brighton and Hove. Just to echo what others have already said, thank you so much for coming to listen to what we're having to say today. It's really appreciated. I know you've probably all had long days. So before we start, I want to share some audio from a recent development and then we're going to talk a little bit about the milestones leading up to this moment. So the first person you're going to hear is Councillor Ty Goddard followed by Councillor Lucy Helliwell at a recent Brighton and Hove Schools Committee meeting in January. So I'm just going to play this and then we'll continue. The committee agreed to change the admission priorities for Brighton and Hove community secondary schools to include a new priority for pupils eligible for free school meals up to the city average percentage. This is a big, bold move. And I want to, like Adam, pay credit to colleagues up in the gallery there from uh, Class Divide for holding a mirror up to this city, holding a mirror to that educational inequality and bringing this issue to public attention, to the attention of politicians. And I pay absolute and utter credit to you all up there. And frankly, a big thank you to Class Divide for your support, leadership on this issue. Thank you so much. Any other comments or questions? 
questions we have on this. No? Well, right, okay. I would like to put this to the vote then. Does the committee agree on changing of the free school meals in the admission oh, arrangements? Thank you. And is anyone against? And are there any abstentions? Thank you very much. Carly. Sorry, I'm not going to cry again. So who are Class Divide? Class Divide are a grassroots campaign group made up of people, um, residents, experts and supporters, many of whom have lived experience of the education divide in the city of Brighton and Hove. We've been campaigning to raise awareness um, around the really deep divides in our city um, and to promote policies that will change that. Um, we're funded by donations and we're politically independent. So, uh, so thanks, Carly. So I just want to share this this slide with you to start with. So there there is a huge gap in attainment in in Brighton and Hove, and and just in this chart here, you can see on the left there's the national average for pupils achieving grades five to nine in English, Maths, GCSE in 2022, followed by Brighton and Hove, and then that third column is the best performing ward in Brighton, and right on the end there is the data for the community that Carly and I grew up in called Whitehawk. So, I mean, we believe that the current system creates huge segregation across the city's schools. And it's probably really important to say that we got interested in these issues partly because the community we grew up in lost its community school in 2005, which resulted in children from our community being spread across multiple schools across the city, but predominantly two schools, all at least three miles away. And our interest is, our interest is in making the school system fair across the whole city, um, where we've got some pretty unfair catchment areas and as I just mentioned, the loss of our community school. So, and it also feels like a lot of people look at Brighton and think it's this liberal, open and inclusive place, but the school data really highlights how wrong that perception is. So, so back to this chart, which is data on the amount of kids on free school meals across secondary schools in Brighton. And you can see there, right on the left, you've got King's School, which has only 15%. And on the right are the two schools that I just mentioned that most of the kids from the community I grew up in go to. So that's Long Hill and Backer. And they've got 38% and 46%. So there's a huge difference. And obviously this has huge implications for the way schools work across the city. Carly. So what has Class Divide done to try to change this? Well, we've raised awareness of this issue both within our community, the communities that we grew up in, over in Whitehawk, in Manor Farm and on the Bristol Estate, but also more widely in the city. And we've done this in a range of ways. We've got a podcast called Class Divide. Um, we've produced publications that we've shared across the city. Um, we've also done um, uh, lots of events and we've tried to really encourage local people um, that we have relationships with and also other people that are just interested in our campaign to take part in the democratic process by submitting petitions, deputations, and taking part in consultations and this is a picture of the hustings event that we did just before the local elections last year yeah so so just on stuff we've done that's really in relation to changing policy so carly mentioned the podcast and we've, we've done all sorts of other things as she just mentioned um and and you know we talked a lot in the podcast series about the catchment areas and the criteria that we feel really sort of go against the, the community that we're, we're from and so it was really important to say that on that point that, you know, we're interested in creating a much more socially and economically diverse school system. We don't really want every kid being drained out of the so-called sort of worst performing schools. We want all schools to be operating at a good level. We certainly don't want to lose another school in the east of Brighton and Hove. So other stuff we've done, we met with the Labour Party when they're in opposition. Um, we secured public commitment to change at those class divide hustings that Carly just mentioned. And when the Labour became a majority in the council, we spent quite a bit of time with them. We brought people like Ellen in and other experts that were featured in the podcast to help support the council in understanding what they might be able to do, what their options might be in making the system fairer. And that's all led up to the policy change being recommended at Children and Young People and Schools Committee in November 2023. And what the committee proposed was to consult on the following change to secondary school admissions policy. So what you can see there is the current policy that's in place right now. And their proposal was that they would um, add a criteria there that would, would give priority to free school meals children up to the city average. Um, and in, Nova, in that meeting in November 2023, the council voted unanimously in favour of a six week consultation. And that's when class divides swung into action. 
Um, we did lots of things and our, our primary aim was to really share uh, the fact that this policy was out for consultation and put the positive case for creating a more socially and economically inclusive school system across the city. We did that through a series of events. We released a special edition of the podcast where we set out why we would support the proposal, even though it's not perfect, nothing is. Um, and we also gained quite a lot of, uh, we worked quite hard to get some media attention, both locally and nationally. We reached out to groups like the Sutton Trust, actually we we're already working with the Sutton Trust, who and, and encourage as many people as possible to um, participate in that consultation process, whatever their views. And we were lucky enough to get a, a Guardian opinion on the day of the final vote. Uh, but we were also uh, featured in Schools Week and other publications as well, BBC. Yes, yeah, it's, it's probably also important to say that in the past when these kind of consultations have happened and when there's been a sort of debate in the city about changing catchment areas, people from the area that we grew up in probably haven't taken part in the way. They certainly haven't had the louder voices um, in those in those consultations and those discussions. And I think that's you know, that stuff that Carly was just talking about. It's why we work really hard to make sure that the voices that aren't often heard or listened to in a place like Brighton Hove really were. Um, and it was super important that we did that. So I just want to share some stuff about the consultation responses, which which we sort of got some of this information from, from the council. So 1,404 people took part in the consultation, which is apparently a record in consultations in Brighton Hove. Um, so 593 people tended to agree or strongly agree with the proposed changes compared to 401 respondents who strongly disagreed or tended to disagree with the proposals. The reasons for included creating a fairer policy for free school meal kids, um, Brighton Hove being a fairer place to live, um, there being better access and more choice for children living in low-income families. And the Sutton Trust Fairer School Admissions Research was quoted heavily in the uh, the paper that was released to committee uh, at the start of this year. And specifically, it mentioned the findings that 50% of senior leaders in schools are of the view that social segregation is a problem in state schools, something that Rebecca mentioned earlier. Introducing people premium priority, uh, priority criteria would help to fight this issue and that 78% of parents believe that schools should have a fairer mix of pupils from different social backgrounds. There were obviously objections and these included stuff like the council were virtue signalling, that the, the changes would reduce the number of places available to children living within catchment areas which then might have a knock-on consequence uh, in the event of oversubscription. Um, travel journeys would increase, families and communities would run the risk of being split, uncertainty about splitting up friendship groups, um, that free school meals was a blunt measure that unless assessed yearly would provide protection for some pupils even if those families are no longer on benefits, um, that making housing more affordable and ensuring all schools perform at the same level would be a much better approach. Some responders were concerned about the impact on schools that would have fewer children and less funding. And, and I have to admit, this is a concern of, of ours as well, and, and maybe we can say a little bit about this later. And there was also concern there wasn't enough information to demonstrate the impact of the policy changes, and so responses were sufficient, uh, insufficiently informed. But as you heard right at the start in that clip, um, on the 22nd of January, councillors voted in favour of those proposed changes. And that started a bit of a whirlwind week for us, especially Carly, who ended up on national TV speaking about the news. And the policy that will come into effect this September, and remember the changes for this policy are only going to apply to local authority maintain, maintained schools, which is six out of ten secondary schools in Brighton and Hove. And so in a year's time, around this time, parents will be finding out if this change to policies will have impacted their choices on National Offers Day in 2025. But between now and then, there's a lot of work to do and there's lots of other stuff we're interested in supporting. And, and we're really going to be pushing for the support that's going to be needed for parents, pupils and schools across the city to really benefit from this new policy. While reminding everyone why those changes are so important. I think most people I knew at that school, and I knew the half, the, most of the school. I think there was two people in my year that we been thought would get decent jobs, but the rest of us, we were just we just accepted that very early in senior school that we'd have to just we'd have to be them, take them lesser jobs. And maybe we did think we were lesser people. Yeah, it's, it's crazy, isn't it? When you it put it like that. So, you know, we obviously feel that no child should be ever made to feel that they're a lesser person. And these kinds of policy changes for us are the start of ridding that kind of thinking, that kind of thought from our school system. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, guys. And 
I think what's so wonderful to hear about Brighton and Hove is just how much national interest there has been as well. And I think we're in a real moment in time now and, and everybody here at this webinar, you obviously feel this too. There's a real moment where we could make some really significant change. And there's a lot of momentum in this area now. You can see from the research that Ellen's doing, the research we do, the changes in Brighton and Hove, there really has never been a better time to be a leader amongst other leaders. I heard Carly use that phrase at one of her talks. And this is a really good opportunity for us to all stand together and do this. So which takes me really nicely onto my slot, which is how we're going to support schools in making change. So I've just got to reshare my screen. OK, so um, sort of last sort of slot before we move on to Q&A, and I can see the Q&A box has been really busy, so do keep those questions coming, um, is I want to talk to you about the opportunities that we've got here at the Sutton Trust to support any school, local authority or multi-academy trust that might be interested in joining uh, us on this journey. And the uh, Fair School Admissions Pledge and the subsequent Fair School Admissions Award runs between March and July of this year. So we'll start with the expectations on the schools that join the pledge and what we would be asking schools to commit to if they do that. Um, as you've heard from across the speakers today, there are lots of different elements to fair school admissions. And we've tried to break that down into kind of four sections that schools might want to start looking at. So the first one is that we would ask schools who join the pledge to do a fair access review. And really, this is just a, an exploration before you do any implementation, before we all run off to action of actually just assessing where your school is on that fair admissions journey. Uh, so it's a comparison, actually looking at the percentage of FSM children in your school compared to the national picture and the local picture as well. It's looking at your admissions policies and reflecting on whether the actual policy itself is is causing barriers. Do you rely on distance or do you rely on, uh, you know, maybe you have a musical aptitude and the way that you assess the music, could that be uh, tweaked slightly to make it a bit fairer? But also looking at the way your policy is communicated. You know, one of the things that um, I've been looking a lot into is the average literacy levels of adults in the UK. And one in six adults in the UK are functionally illiterate, which means that they can read things that are simple or things that are familiar to them but a parent reading a 25 page admissions policy that might be quite challenging for them and are there things that we can do to make that more accessible for parents we're going to ask you to look at actually working out how much money will it cost a parent from the minute they find out they're attending your school to the end of year seven how much money are they actually going to have to spend to be at your school how much uniform are they going to have to buy how many pens pencils rulers calculators what are the school trip commitments? And then actually comparing that to the average household income of a family that qualify for free school meals and whether that actually feels fair. And then alongside that, what support are you offering those families? Um, and what we're asking is that this becomes part of your governor's meeting cycle. So either as part of your formal governor meetings or perhaps the ones that you have a sort of head teacher to governor or CEO to trustee, however your situation works. So the next thing would be then doing a really good deep dive and action plan around the cost for your parents as well. So I won't run through all the different things that you can do to reduce the cost in your school, but really forensically looking at that, seeing where are the places that we could perhaps shave on spending for parents or where are the opportunities for us to offer more support to parents that might need it so that they can access it. And I think it's easy for us sometimes to forget that um, or to accept that there will be some things that children can't do perhaps or okay not everyone will be able to afford to go on that theatre trip but actually looking at that holistically how many opportunities are children missing out on over time at your school and what's the long-term impact of that similarly we would how well are you publicizing and forensically analyzing the take up of the free school transport offer in your schools as well so children at secondary schools uh, children that are eligible for free school meals can get free school transport to one of the three closest schools within six miles um we'll, we've got some resources on that to help you as well but are you making sure that parents know about that are you helping them to apply for those those sorts of things and then that leads us on to clear support for families as well so again really looking at 
the support that you are providing families. It's really, really daunting to move your child from primary school to secondary school. I was a vice principal and worked in secondary schools for 15 years and I've just had to pick my children's primary schools and I thought that would be super easy and that was terrifying for me and I completely overthought it. So there's a lot that we can do to support families. Again, having really parent-friendly versions of your pupil premium strategy, having parent-friendly versions of the support that you'll provide. Again, I know if you're a school leader and you find out that one of your families is in really challenging circumstances, you absolutely will do everything you can to support them. You know, I've worked in schools, I'm sure we all have, where we have paid for hotels and we've fed the family and we've got them coats and all of those things. But does every single family in crisis know that you'll do that for them? Do they know that that support is available to them? And, and then also working with primary schools as well. And then I'll kind of find it final and sort of boldest ask is for schools to really look at their admissions policies and Becky's talked a little bit and I know Ellen has as well about some of the different ways that you could change your policy to make it fairer so we've looked at pupil premium priority ballots and banding I know there's been a few questions about banding come up in the box which uh, my colleague Becky's been answering um, banding has a lots of different ways that it can be implemented but in the most ideal situations because you would take the same number of children across each band and this is uh, to answer a question which someone said or would that then benefit you to have tutoring to get yourself into a higher band I guess the answer would be no not really because you take an equal number of children from each band um, and that makes it fairer so there's no benefit to being tutored to get yourself in a higher band necessarily um, so there's different mechanisms that schools could look to implement and we've got lots of support to help you with that but again looking at your policy itself is it accessible can parents use it is it as simple as it could be and I think regardless of what kind of school you are whether you're a faith school or not a faith school uh, whatever the kind of history of your school is any school could look to implement some of those things in a context that suits their school we know that every school will have a sort of special set of circumstances around them so before I kind of move on to look at the support that we will offer you and the kind of rewards with that we're just going to do another poll question just to get some feedback really so of those four ideas that we've looked at so the fair access review looking at the cost of schooling the support for families and your admissions policies my colleague Sophie's going to pop just a ranking question on there we're just interested to hear for your school what which of those are you most likely to implement which of those do you think you would be least likely to implement so I'll just give everyone about a minute to just quickly rank those for us And while people are just finishing up that, just to reiterate, those that join the pledge, we're not expecting any of our schools to do all of those things. This will be a very bespoke journey for each school. We'll be working with you to select the things that are appropriate for you to do at this time, things that might be appropriate for you to do in the future. And we're kind of working together. We, we'll, we all want the same things, really, and we're here to support you to make as much difference as your school is able to at the moment. OK, thank you, Sophie. So in terms of the support that we will offer you, we know there's probably been very few times in the past where it's been more challenging to be a school leader than it is at the moment. And we want to make sure that you feel really well supported if you choose to join us in this journey. So there will be lots and lots of training and CPD available for you. There is um, another two webinars between now and July that you might want to join to help you on this journey with the various bits of paperwork. When you join the pledge, you'll get access to Start and Trust research and Start and Trust expertise as well. My whole job at the Start and Trust is School Admissions, so I'm here at the end of an email to help you with any of your questions. And we also know that because we're asking you to involve your governors in this, there might be some CPD specifically for your governors to upskill them so that they can make really well-informed choices about that. And we're gonna be helping you out with that and providing some CPD as well. Any school that join will then be part of a network of schools that are all on the same journey. And we all know the power of collaboration and learning from each other and being able to share that best practice. And then we also know how, how time poor school leaders can be. 
So we're going to try and take as much of the heavy lifting here for you as possible. So we're going to be providing uh, any a wealth of templates, presentations for staff. Um, it was interesting in the first question and the barriers, a few people submitted that one of the barriers that they're worried about is parental, uh, negative parental concerns and parents not being happy with changes being made. We're, we're really aware of that. Um, and actually there's been some really interesting research that, especially so there's um, places in America that have done similar things to this. And what they found is parents said they were gonna be very difficult about it, but when it actually was implemented, they all just kind of accepted it and continued to send their children to the school that was best for them. So I think sometimes there's a fear of par parental kickback when there may not be. And that's certainly been the experience we've had in Brighton and Hove as well, that the positive voices that came out and spoke for them far outweighed the negative. So there's lots and lots that we're gonna offer to help and uh, on your journey. But then really what this is all about is what, what's the reward at the end of this? You know, why are we asking school leaders to take time out of a busy time of year and already in a busy job to really look at this? And um, we've been talking to some of the schools that are flagged up from Ellen's work. Um, and there's two examples that I just wanted to share with you here. One of them is from Totteridge Academy that you might have seen them in the media lately. They just received an award from TESS for School of the Year. And when I spoke to Chris about his admissions policy, they use the pupil premium priority. And what he said, the thing that made him feel the most pride about their policy wasn't just that they did really well for their children, all of their children do really well, but that it sets a clear vision and moral purpose for their school, that all their staff can hold their head up high, knowing that they're here to serve any child that wants to come and work in their school, particularly vulnerable families that might not otherwise get the opportunity to attend that school. And I think that's such a powerful thing, particularly when looking at the recruitment and retention that we're all facing in schools at the minute, to be in a school that really can hold your head up high and say, we are doing the very best thing we can. That's an incredible reward for doing this work. And then equally, Joe, who I think is actually here today, I think I saw a question pop up from Joe. Uh, I went to visit Joe's school a few months ago and it was genuinely one of the most inspirational delightful schools I've ever seen the children were incredible um but they talk a lot about if you change a child's life by one degree you can change the trajectory of their entire lives and you could absolutely see that happening at Joe's school again they do a pupil premium priority and you can see the children are going to get so much from having had that opportunity to attend that incredible school those children are going to go on and do amazing things what there is no better reward for school teachers and school leaders to know that we've done that but also pragmatic and we know that there will be an element of um something so a tangible outcome for schools as well and we really want to recognize schools that are doing this work so schools that join us on the pledge will at the end of their pledge get awards from us that they can use on their websites and their sort of letterheads and everything so you can really be proud and show the world that you are part of the fair admissions journey and that you're joining the fight um, there are different levels that can we'll be awarding depending on the work that schools are doing. Now, you might be sat here today and think, well, actually, my school does a lot of that already. And that might well be your school. So in terms of next steps, if you've been listening to us today and think, well, yeah, actually, that we do do a lot of that. We would like to recognise you straight away, basically. So if your school is one that does some of this work already, all we really need to know is who you are. And then we would like to recognise this fantastic work with the school awards straight away. So after this webinar, we'll be sending out application forms or links to the application forms. It's a really brief form. It's literally like school details, some details on your FSM, and then a brief reflection on the positive impact this has had on your culture. That will then get come back to me and we'll be able to read through that and determine the award that you qualify for. If you are just starting out on this journey and this is the first time you've really been thinking about it, in terms of next steps, what we would ask is you go away, talk to the rest of your SLT and decide that you want to commit to the pledge. Again, there's a very brief application form to let us know that you're working with us. And then the first step will be to do that fair access review that we talked about at the start of this session. From that, we'll then help you build an action plan for actually implementing change in your school. And at that point, you can then apply for the award as well. So hopefully you'll see there's lots to lots of support there, lots of really tangible steps for schools. And we're talking about between now and July. So a kind of short, sharp programme to make some tangible impacts ready for the next school year. 
So final sort of opinion bit from us now, and then we'll move on to the Q&A session. Uh, so Sophie will put the last question up for us. Having listened to the evidence today, having listened to my colleagues uh, from across the industry, how do you now feel about joining the journey to change school admissions? So if Sophie will put that up for us and I'll give you a kind of minute or so to answer that and then I'm going to hand over to Binder for Q&A. Okay, so I think we're probably ready to move on to Q&A. Great, thanks Charlie. Hi everyone, nice to meet you all and see you all online. Um, so just to the final part of the session, so we're just going to be going through some of the questions that you've been dropping in the Q&A box. Thank you for those that have submitted those and for those that have upvoted as well, so we can kind of make sure we whittle through all of them. We've got about 45 minutes left, which is I think ample time to cover the questions that we've um, got. So what I'd like to do is, um, I know Becky's been helpfully answering some of those questions, but for those that are kind of watching this back in the, fu in, in the future, who won't necessarily see those questions being answered, I thought it would be helpful um, if I just read out the question and then Becky could maybe respond to some of those, but also a good opportunity for the panel to also chip in at different points if anything kind of comes up that you think you'd like to kind of um, add to the conversation. So the first question that we've got that's already been answered um, by Becky, but it's, it's from Steve. Hi, Steve. Um, really nice to see you after a really long time. Um, so in um, uh, the Northeast, uh, don't don't school religious schools make up a higher percentage of the top schools so Becky wasn't quite too sure about this but Ellen I feel like you might know the answer to this <laughs> I'm afraid I can't say on the top of my head we do have all that information but I'd have to go away and look it up I'm so sorry I can't answer it now no problem we can definitely make sure we maybe send that out as a follow-up um and then the second question that we've had um, is um, from Megan and it goes, should the Equality Act 2010 exempt uh, exemptions which allow faith schools to prioritise children on the basis of their family religion be rep repealed? Um, and Becky, over to you. Yeah, so the Sutton Trust is an organisation where completely neutral in terms of religion, faith. We don't have a position on if faith schools should exist or not, if there should be any selection in schools on the basis of faith. Um, what we're saying basically is that we can see that there are a particular category of school that has some of the particular issues around access and that they need to do more to be able to open up access. And that could, in some instances, for some schools, mean that they use criteria like pupil premium eligibility before they get to faith-based criteria, but we don't have any position on if they should more widely exist or not. Great. Any of the other panellists want to come in on that before I move on? Yeah, Ellen, go for it. Yes. Um, so just one thing to add is that what we noticed in the data from the, the big collection of uh, secondary school admissions criteria is that many faith schools, or at least some faith schools, have a proportion of their seats those for those for the wider community so they might have 70 percent of seats where they give priority to faith but they reserve 30 percent of the places for those of a different faith or no faith so it's another example of a way that you can retain the identity of a school maybe the ethos of the school but still open up your um, admissions criteria as well great and charlie yeah and i just really want to echo uh what rebecca said and kind of build on that a little bit in terms of i think all of the ideas that we've talked about today that we can make schools more accessible would apply to any school and as someone who has read a lot of admissions policies and I'm sure Ellen would feel the same I think even some simple things like using some visual flow charts and things like that in admissions policies for faith schools could go a long way to sort of making those a little bit more accessible so I think yeah as Becky said we don't have a position on it but certainly anything we've suggested today might help where we've identified a particular problem. 
Great, thank you. Um, so surely the banding option, even if offered widely, runs the risk of more affluent parents paying for tutoring once they know that this is at risk. And I think that's already been answered, but if anyone else wants to come in on that before I move on. Yep, Ellen, go for it. <laughs> just, just to say that I, I agree that in principle, there should be no strategy. There should be no gaming in terms of how you perform on the test. But I think, you know, in some areas you might predict, actually, it's beneficial for my child if they perform badly on the test, given the, the demographics of the area. So um, I think you're right that in principle, banding should give a, a level playing field and, and should end up with an equal proportion of pupils across bands. But I think there, there is a risk in some areas that, that parents might kind of second guess and, and try and try and gain in some way. Yeah, I agree. And with also, that. also the general point. I'm um, sorry. Also, the general point um, that's already been made that having the banding done in schools, making sure that everyone can do it, and having it at the area level is a is a, the best way to go. Yeah, no, I just say I'd agree with that. Um, I just think it would be quite tricky to do, and certainly it's not as straightforward in the way of if you want to get your kid into a grammar school, say, and want them to pass the eleven plus, it's quite clear what you need to do. Whereas this is much more complicated than that, and is taking a certain amount of risk as to what you're planning, like if you think they should do better or worse. Great, thank you. Um, so a question from Joe: are parents entitled um, at the primary school level to free travel if they are on, um, in receipt of FSM? Um, I think that might be something for either Becky or for Charlie to answer. Becky, I can, you're, you, are, you know so much more about buses and public transport. <laughs> no, um, I actually wasn't totally sure and had to look it up as to what it was in primary school. And I've popped the link in. I think it's only if you're aged eight to 11, um, if you're on a low family income. and you, But that's only actually to the nearest school, at least two miles away. And obviously people at primary school level tend to go to one that's nearby anyway. But the much wider support with transport costs is for secondary school pupils. So if they're on a low income and the child is aged 11 to 16, they can go to a school two to six miles away if it's one of their three nearest suitable schools and get free transport for that. But I've popped a link in and I've also said I wouldn't be surprised if some boroughs, local councils might have different policies where they paid on top of what's that minimum government expectation. So it's really worth checking with your local council on their website what the exact policy is in your area because I expect it will differ. Um, anyone else? Yep. Curtis, yeah I mean Class Divide have done quite a lot of campaigning on bus and transport stuff I mean specifically for secondary schools over the last few years it is a very confusing set of policies and rules that often confuse all the people running it as well as families um, who, who seem to give us a different answer every time we ask a question about it. I mean, obviously, it's gonna it's gonna be even more important now with this with this new policy coming into place in Brighton. I mean, you know, the challenge we've got in Brighton is we have a private bus company, and you know, the council are, are sort of almost powerless to do that much apart from pay them subsidies to run bus services, and it, it's complicated. And and but we, you know, we are pushing for for changes there, and and hopefully we'll see them certainly in support of this this policy change in Brighton. Thank you. Um, so there's a question from Alice, which is, um, is there any data available specifically for admissions to sick forms? Um, I don't think that we do have any of that data at the moment. Ellen, you might be collecting that, but I see you shaking your head so possibly. No, no I'm so sorry. <laughs> we just looked at secondary schools, um, yeah. which was a huge data collection, it took us around a year to do. So maybe there's the scope for the future, but, but yeah. not currently. OK, thank you. Um, and then a question from Jackie, which is banding surely only works when it's used by all schools in the area rather than just some um, and where all students take the test in their own primary on the same day rather than a Saturday morning somewhere else. And when banding is done in relation to all of uh, those young people living in the area um, rather than just those who uh, come from a specific um, location. Um, so Becky, you've responded to that, but um, the answer that Becky's given already is yes, absolutely. Ideally, all schools in a local area would do ex the exact same test and all children would be automatically enrolled to do it. Um, and I think that's the practice that we've seen in certain areas of the UK already and see it working very well. 
Um, so Joe's got a question on FSM criteria and whether that's been increased in line with inflation. If the main universal credit and income threshold criterion of 7,400 is frozen, surely we are removing families um, over time, specifically um, when living in expensive areas like London. They may still be a disadvantage and we may be excluding families due to the threshold being frozen. Um, Ellen, did you want to come in on this? Sorry, um, um, if I may say something on the banding as well, because I maybe sounded too critical of banding earlier, but I think that where it's run at the local authority level, it is doing great things. It's leveling the play of play, leveling the playing field for schools. Um, and so just to just to throw my weight behind the banding being done at the at the local authority level, or at least the wide area level. Um, in terms of the FSM premium, I think that's absolutely right that with the threshold being frozen, it's not going to help everyone that needs to be helped. And so I think sometimes there's a trade off between widening, widening your emissions criteria more generally, for example, having 20% of your seats reserved for those outside the catchment area, having a lottery for your admissions, which will help everyone across the income distribution, versus having a more targeted approach, which will only help a, a smaller and smaller fraction of those at the bottom of the income distribution. So it's um, a tricky one and probably the best solution will depend on your circumstances. Great. Becky? Yeah, I just wanted to add a little bit on the FSM issue, which is also, yes, it will not include all of the lower income families, but also one of the drawbacks of the approach of just doing pupil premium priority rather than a more holistic overall change to an admission system like ballots or banding is that it's only focusing on that absolute bottom bit of the income distribution and it's not doing anything to alter the kind of social economic mix in your school more widely, which the other approaches can contribute to. So, you know, it's only telling you so much. And as with any of these things, there are kind of trade offs and, and different bits you're getting from different measures. Curtis? Yeah, I just want to say also that, you know, as I said when we were when we were doing our, our talk, you know, the point of this isn't just to shunt a whole load of pupils into the so-called best performing schools. It's there's a movement both ways, so all schools benefit from it. So, you know, there are there should be, if it's done properly and there's effective support put into schools, that better socioeconomic mix should benefit all the schools if it's done properly. Great, thank you. Um, so a question from Esther. Have you thought about the experience of selection for disabled SEN pupils in these highly selective areas, especially those who are also FSM eligible too? Um, so I know our research hasn't specifically looked at this. Ellen, I'm not sure if your research has or not. Well, just to say more generally that if, if a child was eligible for the education, health and care plan, then they would obviously have absolute priority. Um, there were an, a minority of other schools which did give some priority if a child had particular uh, special educational needs. I can't tell you the exact number of schools that currently do that, but I can tell you it's low. Charlie? And I think in terms of just to add, we know that that kind of crossover between FSM and SEND is really profound. If you are, you know, if you have meet one of those labels, chances are you might meet another as well. But I think, again, a lot of the things that we're suggesting make access fairer for everybody. And again, as, as a mother of a child trying to navigate the SEND system, it's very complex. And anything we can do to make life easier for parents at any point is going to be beneficial for all groups of parents, really. Great, thank you. Um, so uh, a question from Joanne. So I think I read that all but one of the 155 comps that are worse than grammar schools for SF FSM access are faith schools. What can we do about the fact that so many highly selective schools have faith admissions and seem unlikely to change? Um, Becky, did you want to come in on that one? Because you've answered that question already in the chat. Yeah, so I'm not sure, sorry, we've got that information on that 155 specifically. But I think on the wider point of how are we going to make change given kind of faith school general admissions criteria, I think some of the other answers have spoken to that already, that a lot of these questions, sorry, changes we're suggesting can be used by all sorts of different kinds of schools to improve their kind of general social economic mix. And I think as we've done today, having this kind of open conversation with schools of all types is the way to get change on this. And 
the great work that Klaus Divide did in Brighton shows the power of talking about this. And if you keep pushing, you can actually get change on these things. So I am quite hopeful that it is possible to get change on this. Great, thanks, Becky. Um, and then one final um, question that's already been answered in the chat, and then we'll go to the open question. So how does having students with lottery places rather than distance places traveling from one side of the area to another for a school fit within the green agenda? Becky? <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is a really good point, and it is something we've been talking about internally as well. It's really going to depend on the context of the school and where exactly you're talking about, because there will be some schools where we're talking about really quite small distance differences, especially some of those ones that use the absolute distance from school that's making the difference if a kid gets to go there or not. So whether or not they're going that small extra distance that maybe they could walk or cycle is, is less of a big issue. Obviously, if you're talking about places maybe in more rural areas where there are fewer schools just in general, that's where it gets trickier and you're having to think of those trade-offs. I think in general, making sure that you have access to transport options. So, for instance, school buses that can mean that you're transporting lots of kids and in a much more kind of eco friendly way can be a way to tackle that. Um, but it, it is an important issue to bring up and it's something we have to be mindful of in these conversations and that we have been thinking about. Ellen. Yeah, thank you. I, I also agree. It's a great question and I agree with everything um, that Becky said. Um, I'd just like to take a step back and make a general point that all these admissions criteria are conditional on the school being oversubscribed and conditional on parents making a choice for that school in the first place. So it may be the case that um, a, a parent does choose a school that's the other side of the city. It's much more likely that a parent is choosing between one of their closest schools. So what the lottery would be doing is opening up that, that, that choice. Um, that's not to say that entry increased congestion, increased pollution is not a concern. And I, I think there are certainly trade offs to be made in terms of having local community schools versus having more accessible schools. Um, but I think that the what I wanted to remind people of, of, of was it, that it's all conditional on parents choices, um, not a general lottery and anyone could end up anywhere. Great. Um, so a question from Steve, um, chicken and egg question, doesn't attainment gap dictate good depending on the school intake? Who from the panel wants to take that one? <laughs> Any volunteers? Yep. Yeah. Oh, you're on mute, sorry. <laughs> of course I'm on mute, five years into this. Um, our position at Classified is that we don't know what the actual na national data would look like on this question, but our, our local understanding is that often a school and how it's doing is reflective of its intake. And that's one of the re one of the things that, one of the criticisms that was leveled up, the, the suggestion that we make a, or we try to create a more social and economically integrated school system in the city, is it would essentially make all schools mediocre. <laughs> You know, because I think other people kind of understand it in that way too. Um, you know, we're not that that's not what class divides are trying to achieve. Um, but I do think that there is an in, in, inevitably this kind of relationship between who you're teaching, the way you're teaching them and, and what their outcomes are. Um, and that's one of the things I think that we I think it was interesting. Ellen Groves put it really well in our podcast, which was actually schools should see this as a as a as a positive challenge if you're if you have a school that's really good and is able to add value to and change the life of any child that walks through your door essentially that's really what success in education should look like and i think we took a lot of um like that was quite that was a very powerful way of putting it for us in the campaign and and i think that that's been quite that's our position essentially it's quite important to take that position Yep, um, Ellen, and then I'll bring you in, Charlie. Um, so um, so it, I think it is a chicken and egg question to some extent, but I think that we should, and, and obviously different reports and different research will define school um, quality differently. But I think that there's a general point that intake isn't everything, um, but it can shape, you know, we know from research that peer composition matters and having a, a more diverse peer group can positively affect multiple outcomes. But there's also something around teacher sorting. Um, and as has already been discussed, maybe it's easier to recruit and retain your better teachers 
if the school is more mixed rather than having a, a more disadvantaged population. Um, so I think, yes, it's, it's slightly circular, but there are things that schools can do and, and are doing to improve people's performance. Great, Charlie? I think I just wanted to add that that it kind of, not exactly answering this, asking this question, but it, it does link to a kind of body of questions that we've had come to us when we've been doing our research about um, outcomes and if you change a school composition, does that going to put a lot of pressure on your school? If you are a school that gets very good outcomes and you increase your FSM intake, what pressures is that going to put on you as a school? And, you know, honestly, there isn't huge amounts of research on this, but where there is research, so for example, there's a really good case study in North Carolina in the US that did what they called a socioeconomic desegregation school admissions policy. And what they found there is that the high income, the children from high income households, their outcomes kind of stayed the same, even when the socioeconomic mix increased in their school. But the children from lower income households that then changed and went to different schools, their outcomes rose significantly in reading and in maths. So it rose the outcomes of the children that perhaps weren't getting such high outcomes before, and it had minimal impact on the other children. So it was a kind of a win-win for everyone. So, you know, there's, we don't really know the answer, I guess, is the question, but is the, is the honest answer. But there are some positive emerging ideas that it, it could be a good thing for everyone. Great, thanks, Charlie. So um, a question about um, whether we'll be publishing the catchment area um, FSM figures for London schools. Um, I think that's either a Becky or a Charlie question <laughs> for you to answer. <laughs> I think, Charlie, you know better than I do where we're at on what we're going to be allowed to publish. <laughs> yeah, so it's absolutely something that we are working very, very hard on to get that data into the hands of school leaders because it is a really powerful piece of data. So it's a bit of a watch this space. There is a lot of um, hoops to jump through to publicly publish that kind of data. And we are working very hard to get that data to you. And we've got some backup plans for where you might be able to get some similar, if not quite so exact data, if we can't do it. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Fingers crossed. <laughs> um, so a question about Tunbridge Wells and the grammar school system. I think the question has been answered by another teacher, but Joanne, if you're still on the call, please do let me know if you have an additional question on this. Um, and then another question that we've had is how do we unpick the idea that a good school will be a higher performing due to its socioeconomic profile, as in wealthier pupils being known to achieve better results? I believe that disadvantaged people should have access to highly rated schools for so many reasons, but it is more than the benefits of social cohesion and not necessarily all about results. I think we've kind of answered some of that question, but if anyone wants to add anything for it, then please do pop your hand up and feel free to unmute. No? Great. Yeah, I feel like we've already kind of covered the elements of this question already. So thank you to the panel for answering that. Um, and then a question. Um, uh, sorry, just working my way through. Um, so in our area, North Lancashire, there is a lot of difficulty getting a child into a local high school because of the high number of religious grammar schools. Could the Sutton Trust look at the eff effect of these socially segregated school criteria on a local, regional or national elective home education figures? Um, Becky? Yeah, we haven't actually ever looked at home education as a topic. We tend to focus on the majority of students within the general school system. It would be really interesting to look at whether this has any impact, um, but I'd, we haven't looked at it, unfortunately. Yeah, maybe one for, for later when we get a bit of chance to kind of dive into the data in a bit more detail. Um, banding is allowed under the admissions code. Is there a national is there national research to prove that poorly implemented banding is socially exclusive? Ellen, maybe one for you. <laughs> um, so yeah, there are a few research papers. Um, I think if you wanted to look at a research paper, I would suggest um, searching for Anne West, who's a professor of education. She's done a, she's done a lot of work on banding, um, banding at the school level versus banding at the local authority level. On the flip side, banding is almost one of the only school admissions criteria where there is, at the local authority level, where there's evidence which 
to say that it does um, integrate schools. Uh, local authorities are less segregated by income where there is a local authority wide policy. Um, so I would say that on the evidence for the local authorities and on the school level, I would suggest um, looking at Anne West's research. Great, thank you. Um, and then uh, just a few final questions. So do you have any hints or tips for local authorities where the local authority wishes to influence change, but there are a high number own admission authority schools who are resistant to change their oversubscription criteria? So I think that's coming from a local authority who's asking how we might be able to tackle some of that resistance that might be there from local schools to change their criteria. Becky? I can say something on this because I did previously give a little bit of advice to a local area that had exactly this kind of problem. Um, what you need to do basically is get together some sort of body that gives those schools a space to talk with one another and see it as kind of a joint issue. So if you can set up something locally, like it will only ever be voluntary, but go and talk to those schools get them together there can be other benefits of them speaking to one another as well like in this area I think it was just called a general education advisory board and admissions was one of the issues that they looked at so that would be my advice is do some work to get the schools together and then make the case to them because if it is voluntary for them that's the only way to do it yep Charlie yeah I think Becky's absolutely got it right as as the way to work with those school leaders I also think you know two things for me first of all most school leaders have done some sort of school leadership training and school leadership number one is start with why so I think really basing your argument in the kind of ethical reasons why they should engage with this will get you a long way with school leaders we do school leaders are school leaders mostly because they want to make children's lives better um, but I also think just from our own experiences in setting this program up asking a school to change their admissions policy is a big step but there's as we've talked about today a whole host of smaller steps that schools can take first which don't feel as big and scary that also take a lot less time that don't involve consultations that might get you the first step of the journey and once you've started that journey it's much easier to then make bigger changes along the way. Curtis? Yeah I mean it's not a quick um set of actions but i think you know you could follow some of the approaches that class divide have taken where you build a consensus in the city not necessarily just with schools but with citizens in the city who all have something to benefit from there being a fair and equal education system in their city you know and and, and you apply pressure from that that end as well um i i, I think sometimes the school system is left to just parents who have their kids in school at that moment to think about the importance of it. I don't think there's enough discussion about how important it is for every citizen in a city that the education system works for everyone. Um, so, so I think those kinds of discussions, but like I say, that's not a quick practical win for, for anyone. Um, and, and I do not have a, uh, an exact plan how you might make that happen, but I think it's worth considering those kinds of actions. Great, thank you. Um, and then a final question. Um, how far do CEOs and boards of MAPS get involved in decisions about the admissions policies of the individual schools in their trust? I can answer that one, Binda. Yep. <laughs> it entirely depends on the trust and the way that they've set up um, their kind of, every trust will have a, oh, I can't remember the name of the document, but it's a document that says, these decisions are the responsibility of the trust and the trustees. These decisions are the responsibility of the school and the local board of governors. So it just entirely depends on your trust. But again, I'm very happy to work with any trust that any multi academy trust that wants to start unpicking this or go on this journey, and we can kind of work through that together. Great. Um, well done to the panel for whittling through those questions. Um, and thank you to all of those um, of you who submitted your questions. Um, really great kind of breadth of kind of conversations and, and questions that were asked and answered today so thank you. Um, I guess I've been left to do the final few kind of takeaways before we sign off 
um, at this point. Um, so firstly, um, a huge thank you to the panel for your time this evening, um, for kind of giving all of your input on your specific areas and sharing your knowledge and expertise with the group. Um, and for those of you who'll be watching it back, um, you know, it'll be a great opportunity to kind of learn a bit more about the work that's happening across all the different organisations that have joined today. Um, I guess sign up to the pledge um, if this has sparked um, an interest, um, whether you're a local authority, a MAT, a school leader that's kind of been inspired by some of the things that have been discussed, please do get in touch and just look out for the emails after the webinar. Um, we'll be sending you some really clear guidance and lots and lots of support around how you might get involved. So please do. But if you're a school leader and you're already doing some of this fantastic work, then all you have to do is just apply for the award and you'll be kind of given that badge um, to kind of really show your success in, in, in what you've achieved so far. So please do look out for some of that guidance that will come out after the webinar. Um, a final big thank you to the panel, but also to all of you for joining um, uh, today. I know at this point in the day, all you want to do is get home to your family and your um, all your things that you've got to do. But thank you for, for joining us and for staying online for so long. Um, we hope that it's been a really useful and insightful session for you all and you've taken a lot. Um, from it. Um, so yeah, please do continue with that, your journey with us. Um, and we look forward to kind of speaking to you all very, very soon and hearing about all the brilliant work that you'll be doing in your local areas. But yeah, thank you very much. That's it from us, I guess. Bye. <laughs>